All right, Father, just help us to hear what you have to say. Help us not to be the dumb guy with the beard on the video who is not paying attention when the time is right, in Jesus' name. Uh, late in 1958, my, my uh, father was a mile underground, um, buried in a whole pile of dirt down in a coal mine. As a coal miner, he was. The, uh, the tons of dirt that were on him doubled him over so that his head was down on his ankles. He'd been taking a break at the time and um, the weight of the fall of the roof forced his spade, his shovel that he was standing on to cut the sole off his boot and cut the heel off his boot. Um, and uh, thankfully he's bending over, he was in an air pocket. Um, they managed to dig him out. Uh, the uncle that was working with him that day was killed instantly in the roof fall, but my, um, my father wasn't, and he was brought out of the pit alive. Um, there was a time when I would have said, you know, that, uh, that God preserved my father's life, and it may be true, but I also am very conscious that what does that say about my father's uncle? Yeah, Do you know what I mean? So sometimes we... I think it is true, but I think there are complexities in that that, that run a little deeper sometimes than uh, our shallow description. But I'm very grateful that my father was delivered. Um, typical of his generation, um, six weeks later, my father was back at work, even though he didn't have a broken bone, but all the skin was stripped off his back. And you imagine the trauma of being buried, having to be dug out. Six weeks later, he was back at work down the pit. And um, unfortunately, and this is how things go, 18 months after that first accident, he was again down there on a different coal face, and uh, uh, a big lump of stone fell out of the roof, hit him on the back of the head, pinned him to the floor. Um, again, miraculously and thankfully, it landed on some uh, chocks of, of, of coal that held it just enough to stop it actually crushing him to death. Um, my father's brother who was on the face and has always found the story remarkable came. My father was under, you couldn't get to him, but uh, my father's brother Steve put his arm under the, the rock and quite remarkably didn't know where he was, but put his two fingers right into my father's mouth, pulled the coal dirt out of his mouth. Um, and again, my, my father was preserved from death, even, even though there was the trauma of again being buried in the pit for the second time in, in just 18 months. Uh, the top and bottom of that story was that, um, that my father was recommended uh, to quit working down the mine by the, the doctor. Um, it, um, it had affected him. Uh, I remember even growing up as a kid, there were times when my father would have a nightmare that he was running down the coal face and the roof was collapsing in behind him. So you think about it, it's pitch black and... Uh, pretty horrific, you know, so um, there are always stories to people um, that, that you don't always hear and get to know. But my father did really well in that, and he, he really trusted God and, and came through wonderfully, all that. But the top and bottom of that was that uh, my father had to come out of the coal mines, and um, there's very little work in those mining areas at that time if you weren't in the pits. And, of course, if you did come out of the coal mines, you... Um, you were going to get a job where the rate of pay was far, far less because anybody who could work a hard job were all down the coal mine. So uh, my father went, did a couple of jobs uh, in the area, and um, <clears throat> one weekend he came over here to York to, uh, to some special meetings that were being held in um, what was the forerunner of who we are now, which was the Assemblies of God Church in York, which met just round the corner in Bishop Hill at that time in a rented facility. Um, and my father came across to these special meetings, and um, the leader of the church at that time was a gentleman by the name of Willie Roy. And uh, Willie was a very friendly Scot who uh, um, had a way wonderfully of getting involved in people's lives, and so it wasn't long before he'd interacted with my father. And uh, typical to what I remember of Willie, I know him only as a boy uh, growing up because, um, you know, at that time I was just five turning six. Um, he, uh, he said to my dad, well, look, I'll tell you what, if you, you know, move to York and I'll get you a job here in York. 
So, of course, at that time, um, York had a lot of employment in um, more industry, like uh, Roundtree's, which is now, of course, Nestle Chocolate Factory. Roundtree's is a huge employer. Terry's a huge employer. The railways, and uh, he said he'd get my father a job at Roundtree's um, and that he should move to York. Well, you know, when, when you are and have been a, um, a local coal mining village boy, to man, this is the big city, and York's posh as well, so, um, you know, it was, it was quite a big challenge, but of course, my father's also thinking about wife, um, and, and me, of course, is uh, the one child, and, um, <clears throat> and so he, he began to think about potentially moving, moving to York, and um, what was remarkable was that when my father had been here, um, a lady in the church at that time, a very old lady, she looked about 270 to me at the time, um, went to Willie Roy, who was the leader of the church, and said, tell that young man, she'd never met my father, had no clue who he was, tell that young man, if he wants to move to York, I'll buy a house, and he can live in the house, he can pay me back what he can. Uh, just, I mean, didn't know him from Adam, and so... Uh, Cut the long story short, the lady bought a house in, in what was then a, a, a development area, the Groves, and um, she bought a house in 33 Penley's Grove Street, and um, subsequently my father and mother moved in there along with six-year-old boy myself. They went to the um, Sykesley and Brideson solicitors to sort out the paperwork for the house because she said, I want you to have the house. I'm buying the house for you to have the house. Now, this again was quite remarkable because uh, my father at that time, because of what had happened in the pits and what have you, had basically had one week's wages worth of savings, uh, which at that time wasn't a lot back in, back in uh, 1962. That, you know, week's wages wasn't, you know, you were well less than 20 pounds. Um, so that's all he had, really, and yet here he is now, sat in a solicitor's office with, with someone having bought a house specifically for him and his family, um, with no real prior arrangement. And he sat there in the solicitor's office, and the solicitor um, asked my father how much he could pay um, for the house, and he said, well, in all honesty, at the moment, probably a pound a week. Um, which, which I know my father's told me the story many times. A solicitor looked over his glasses, kind of, you know, you having a laugh. Um, to which the uh, dear old lady who was very Victorian, still I remember wearing Victorian dresses and the cane, banged a cane on the floor and, uh, and said, if that's all he can pay, that's all he can pay. Just get on with it, man. So my father finished up coming from um, a coal miner's a coal mining supported house, like a council house in the village, living with my grandmother um, with the week's wages to now being in a home of his own, paying back whatever he could afford. Um, and of course, suddenly my father's um, uh, line of progression in terms even of his own prosperity was in a moment's time just changed and revolutionized. He found it very scary, so did my mum. Um, but uh, they, they were blessed and they built on that and, you know, I, I was a beneficiary of that. What's amazing is that that was how our family was blessed. And uh, one of the things that has happened in that as we, as I just grew up in that environment, is that, is that Chris and I have had the opportunity, because of that, to pay it forward. Yeah. And so I didn't realize until some time ago thinking about this that, that God put on us the challenge to pay forward what had been done for my mother and father. And we have remarkably been enabled to do that, not because we've been able to buy somebody a house, but we've been able to provide housing for lots of people. And I thought, well, should I share this story tonight? But then I went into the office, into my uh, pigeonhole of mail, and lo and behold, I had a letter there which was a, um, a request for a reference for a job application for somebody who we have specifically helped for the last five years in the same context that my parents were helped um, because we have been given the opportunity to bless and to pay that forward. You see, the challenge is that what God does in our lives 
But it's not that God does it so that we can pay him back. It's God does it so we can pay it forward. And I experienced that with my parents in their kindness. They always made that home that they were privileged to have a sanctuary to help. It was always full of students. It irritated the life out of me when I was a kid because I'd come home to a house full of students more often than not, um, some of which we're still in contact with are older than me, and their lives have been radically influenced and blessed to the point that uh, one of those young men emailed me just, just a month ago, a guy called Raymond Trench, uh, making contact, talking about his life, because that was how my parents paid it forward, and we've been able to continue to pay that forward. So I want to talk to you tonight about kindness beyond obligation. I want to talk to you about getting beyond your self-centered image of God and your self-centered image of the responsibility on you because I stress again that everything God did was never so you could pay him back. It was also you could pay it forward to someone else. And every one of you has been blessed in some way. Every one of you has received in some way. The question is, how are you paying that forward into someone else's life? Because the the principle is that as you pay it forward, what you receive begins to multiply. It multiplies in your life and it multiplies in the lives of others so that they can again move forward with that. And I want you to be part of that, that process tonight. And so I want to talk to you about a very specific story in the Bible tonight. Some of you will notice that our LF, AFD squared has now got brackets. That's due to our... Resident mathematics professor sat over there. Miss Claire Cornock, who instructed us that we must do that. So, is that okay, Claire? Is that better? Thank you. So, we now have the brackets on because apparently, if it's only LFD squared, it's only the D that's squared, the do. But we want to, everything to be multiplied by itself, right? The love, the accept. The forgiven, the do, all multiplied. So, um, I, I want to read to you this first bit of my message tonight. It's not something I tend to like to do, but because I want to keep it tight, I, I just want to read to you the introduction to the follow-on story of the story I told you about my father. Many years before the story we are about to uncover, David, one of the two main characters, king of the Israelites, had experienced a trauma which left an indelible mark upon his life. Having lived through incredible highs and devastating lows, he was about to formulate a principle in practice which is a living example of what it means to show kindness beyond obligation. On the road to ultimately becoming king himself, David's greatest friend was the son of Saul, the present king. His name was Jonathan. He was the one in line to inherit his father's kingdom Yet he would not let his position, his power, or his potential compromise his values in respect to kindness and faithfulness. His father grew to hate David as he could see him emerging as the next king, supported by his own son. In his jealousy and his rage, he tried to kill David and hunted him like a fugitive. Yet through all this, Jonathan showed kindness to David he stood between his father's rage and his friend and literally saved his life on more than one occasion at the cost of his own relationship with his father. He refused to support injustice and yet also would not dishonor or fail to be at his father's side in his hour of need. It ultimately cost him his life. One fateful day at his father's side he was killed. One could argue he died in a place he shouldn't have been, fighting a battle he shouldn't have been fighting, alongside someone he shouldn't have been with. Whatever the case may be, David was left deeply hurt and probably never fully recovered. But as we're about to see, the impact he chose for this to have on his life was one of paying it forward so others could experience the full favor of the kindness beyond obligation which he had experienced. So, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we read these incredible words. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? You see, the impact that Jonathan's 
kindness to David had had on David was that in spite of the trauma of losing his friend and his friend being killed in a battle that he might not necessarily have had to be in, David was still somehow had marked David's life in all of his pain that was still asking the question, how can I pay this forward? How can I do something that honors and respects what was done towards me in a way that others can benefit from it? So he asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba, your servant, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? I want you to notice there that whenever we show kindness beyond obligation, it is God's kindness. Because I don't care which belief system you come from, kindness beyond obligation is not commonly found, if at all. And sadly, in most religious expressions of how people think God is, kindness beyond obligation is not something that is found. But I want you to know a God tonight who is kind beyond obligation. He is not obliged to do anything for humanity, but his kindness exceeds his obligation. And that's where he is calling us to be. So Ziba answered, there is still a son of Jonathan, David's close friend, who David loved like a brother, Still a, still a son of, of Jonathan, but here's the classic words. He is crippled in both feet, okay? So now I want to jump back to 2 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4. Here's what it says. Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son, Mephibosheth, who was lame in both feet. Now listen to this. He was five years old. When news about Saul, his grandfather, and Jonathan, his father, came from Jezreel. That was the news that both his father and his grandfather had both been killed on the same day in the same battle. Now the boy is orphaned. He has no grandfather. And not only that, but because his grandfather was the king and an opposing army had killed his grandfather, now he is running for fear of his life. He's under threat of his life. He's gone from the top of the tree to the bottom of the tree. Now instead of ruling over, he is being hunted down. And suddenly this little boy's life is changed. He's five years old. And his nurse picked him up because she realized, I've got to get the boy out of here because this is, a, this is a foreign occupation, war, terrorism situation. And she fled. But as she hurried to leave, he fell and became crippled. Now, I don't know whether he actually fell himself or whether the implication is that as the nurse picked him up and she's trying to take the little five-year-old to safety, that she stumbled and somehow he fell and he injured himself, probably his spinal injury or injury of his pelvis to the point where this little five-year-old boy not only lost his grandfather and his father in one day, but he's now crippled for life. He bears the scars. So as if the traumatic events of that day alone were not enough in the life of a five-year-old, he's now left with a permanent, ever-present reminder of that day. Talk about the wounds of the past. We all bear some degree, to some degree, wounds and scars from events and circumstances outside of our control. Just like this boy. So there was an aspect of his life that he would forever carry as a wound and a scar that were not the result of anything that he had done himself, but were the, the scars and wounds from events and circumstances outside his control. I wonder how many of us in here tonight carry wounds and scars from circumstances and events that were completely out of our control. But still the scars remain. We're still, we're still crippled. We, 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 still, we still can't move correctly because of those wounds that are in our lives. In, in many cases, these have had a profound effect on who we have become as individuals. And I am extremely aware that what our lives have shaped up to be are very often the, 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 the 
the mixture of those things that have happened to us that now, like Mephibosheth, who always had the reminder of what had happened to him, we carry things in our lives that are reminders of maybe how we felt we were misraised as a child, maybe, maybe the aggression, the violence, the, the control, the manipulation, maybe, maybe abuse, maybe you had a, a partner who disappointed you, who, who let you down, who left you, and still the wounds remain. Maybe you've been through the issue of, of the questions of sexual orientation and, and, and relationships and partnerships and, 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 and stuff that you find there in your life that, that seem to be caused by circumstances and events that were beyond your control but have now left you like Mephibosheth uh, with a wound, with, with a scar, with a mark, with a disability that always reminds you that something happened back then that you could not escape and now you bear that in your life right now. Th this, this was the story of this young man, Mephibosheth. But what happened next had a profound effect which resounds through all people of all cultures of all times and is screaming out to us today. Because if we go back to the first chapter we read in 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 4, David the king asked, where is he? Where is this son of Jonathan? Because I want to show him kindness. I want to show him kindness beyond obligation. And Ziba answered, he's at the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. All these interesting names. So King David had him brought. And when Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he said, your servant. And David said, don't be afraid, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. The last thing that this young man was expecting was anyone to show him kindness because his grandfather had hunted David, who was his father's friend, and sought to kill David. And so Mephibosheth was wondering, do I have a friend anywhere? There are some of you in here tonight that actually wonder, even sat in a crowd like this, do I really have a friend anywhere? Because the wounds of the relationships that we've had and the situation we find ourselves in make us feel that maybe we don't have a friend. And also, in those days as well, for the likes of Mephibosheth, being disabled meant that you'd been disowned by God. And some of you might feel you're in the situation you're in because somehow God has disowned you. Some, somehow God is trying to punish you. Somehow God is trying to teach you a lesson in these awful ways. I hate the ways people talk sometimes about the God that I love, the Abba of Jesus, in ways that somehow he would inflict his children with the most horrendous things just to teach them a lesson. You know, I, I didn't learn it as much with my own kids, but I've learned it even more now having a grandchild, that there are things I would never do to Riley to teach him a lesson. I would not inflict him with anything ever in his life to teach him a lesson, but some of you carry those kind of wounds. So here Mephibosheth is in a situation he doesn't know who to turn to, he doesn't know where to turn. In fact, he's happy to be, to be invisible, He's happy not to be open. He, he, he doesn't want to be known because to be known might expose him as the son of Jonathan, the grandson of Saul. And maybe, maybe if he's known, what will happen is more rejection and possibly, possibly death. He'll possibly be, be killed. And uh, it makes me just wonder how many of, of you in here tonight are thinking, I don't want to be known. Because if I'm known, what's going to happen to me? Well, you need to know that David was a, a wonderful picture about God's heart to show kindness beyond obligation. And it was not to be a moment of fear, it was a moment of blessing when finally David finds Mephibosheth and brings him in and Mephibosheth thinks, what's going to happen? But David says, don't be afraid, in verse 7, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather. Now, bear in mind that his grandfather wasn't trying to help David. His grandfather was trying to kill David. That's called grace and forgiveness and kindness beyond obligation. It's called loving your enemies. It's called blessing those who curse you. I, I seem to remember another significant figure 
in the pages of the Bible talked in those kind of ways. Well, this is forever a story of that representation of what the one called Jesus came to teach us to do. And so he's going to bless him, not because of his grandfather, but in spite of his grandfather. He says, I'm going to give you everything that belonged to your grandfather. And he says, you will always eat at my table. And verse 8, Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? That's a way of saying he has no self-esteem. He, he has no personal value. He, he, like many of us, think I, I don't really deserve, in all honesty, to be in any different uh, position than I am in. And yet here he is in verse 11. I'll cut out the first bit, but he says, So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. I love that. The reason he lived in Jerusalem is because he always ate at the king's table. He lived in the place where he had been given a position of recognition in spite of the condition that he had, in spite of his wounds, in spite of his scars that he bore from the experiences of life, he was sat at the king's table, and not just somewhere at the king's table, like down the bottom end, he sat with the king's sons. So if you walked into the, into the dining room of King David, Mephibosheth was with his sons. You could not distinguish Mephibosheth from the physical sons of David because they were all sat at the same table, eating the same food, having the same conversation, under the same blessing. And it says at the end, and he was crippled in both feet. He always ate at the king's table, and he was crippled in both feet. Why is it important to say, again, that he was crippled in both feet, but he always ate at the king's table? Because there's a wonderful principle here that has never changed in the heart of God, is re-emphasized through Jesus, and is part of the LAFD squared of this house, which is this, that crippled Mephibosheth, when he sat at the table with the king's son, looked like everybody else. You couldn't tell that he had wounds, that he was damaged, that his feet were crippled, because David made it that where he came and was introduced into the equation meant that he looked no different to anybody else. You could not see the problem. The problem was under the table, and it was meant to be under the table. And I say for all my critics, if you happen to watch this, our issues, our crippled state, our wounds, our failures, our faults are meant to be under the table. That's where they're supposed to be because in God's grace, when we come to his table, we all look the same. And there might be all kinds of wounds and problems and issues that we have, some of our own making, many the circumstance and issues of life that have brought that upon us. But when we come to the king's table, we all look the same. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus' last supper was spent with a bunch of guys sat at the table. Now among them were some right characters, but when you were at the table, you all looked the same. And Jesus said, when I'm gone, there's something I want you to do. I want you to celebrate this by coming to the table. I was always raised where communion was not called communion, it was called breaking of bread, and even more than that, it was called the Lord's table. So I was invited every Sunday morning when I was growing up as a kid with my parents that we came to the Lord's table. Why did we come to the Lord's table? Because when you're at the Lord's table, we all look the same. All our issues are under the table because he's prepared the table. Now, what's also remarkable is that this same guy, David, who has invited Mephibosheth and had the wonderful revelation to realize that this poor crippled boy, if I sit him at the table, you won't be able to tell the difference. He'll look like one of my sons. He'll eat like one of my sons. And forever he'll feel that he belongs and he'll feel that he is all because he's at my table. That same David wrote a wonderful psalm, which is Psalm 23, which I'm guessing probably every one of you are familiar with. And here's what David said in, this, in Psalm 23. You prepare a table for me 
in the presence of my enemies. Now, you probably thought that was about boasting about the blessing of God. But you see it as a context. The context of the king's table is the story of Mephibosheth, where the one who's wounded and crippled by the events and the circumstances of life comes and sits at the table and looks like everybody else. David had many critics. David had many people who condemned him for many things, but David said, do you know what? You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, my enemies may criticize me, point their finger, judge me and condemn me, but when I'm sat at your table, I look the same as every saint of God. I look the same same as every redeemed, bought back, loved person person. I sit at the table. What David was saying is my enemies may criticize me, but God puts all of my weaknesses under the table. Now you've got to understand David had many weaknesses. He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. He was a liar. He was a cheat. He did many things that I could show you time after time after time. But he says, but God has prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, my enemies could condemn me, but God sat me at his table. So he's put all my failings under the table. So when my enemies look at me, he said, they only see my head, which is anointed with oil, which is touched by God and show that I am received. So kindness is not an act done out of obligation or expectation towards the recipient. Any kindness that is done out of obligation or expectation towards the recipient, listen to me, is not kindness at all. There are many people being proposed as being kind people, but it's not kindness at all because the kindness is only done either out of obligation or expectation towards the recipient. It is that which is done towards another without and beyond any expectation or obligation or deserving. It does not demand or require anything in return from the recipient. So we invite you to come and sit at our table. Because here at our table, all your stuff is where it's not seen. People throw out the line and say, well, you're covering up all the things that people are doing wrong that are sin against God. Now, what we're saying is that God's table that he invites us to is bigger and greater than all the failures and weaknesses that we have, our disabilities, our wounds, the failings, the struggles in our life. They all go under the table. So when God looks at us, he sees king's sons. And we invite you to the table at this house because when you come and sit in this house, what we see is a house full of king's sons. Whatever the stuff is, whatever the wounds, whatever the crippled state of our condition, whatever our disability, it's under the table. That's not the focus of our attention. The focus of our attention is the humanity that God in his grace says, if you'll come and sit at my table, the weaknesses, the failings, the sin, the problems is all under the table and you sit as my sons because I have invited you to my table. We also invite you even more importantly to come and sit at God's table. Because the same one who David said prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies is the same God who prepared a table for you. There may be people pointing out all your faults and weaknesses, but God says come and sit at my table and those faults and weaknesses go under the table. And on the table is the bread of life. On the table is the wine that God talks about that is representative of the blood of Jesus that makes us completely clean from all our problems and issues and allows us to be completely right with God. We invite you to come to the place where we all look the same and to the place where we all receive the same. That to me is even more fascinating. So if you sat at the king's table, we all receive the same. There's no this is for you because you're this, but this is for you because you're that. When the table's prepared, we all receive the same. The kingdom of God is not a tiered system whereby there are haves and have nots, the weak and the strong. The kingdom of God is about an equality that comes to us 
because of the grace of God. We are made righteous by his gift. We are brought to the table through his gift. And just like it says about Mephibosheth, it didn't say he was the son of Jonathan who was David's friend. However, his grandfather was trying to kill David, so he was only going to get the leftovers, the scraps, the crumbs. He said he ate with the king's sons. And you need to know that in the kingdom of God, the true kingdom of God, that Jesus preached, you eat like the king's sons. We all get the same. It's not a tiered system. And all you have to do is come and sit at the table, at the Lord's table. Then you'll be able to say like David in the last verse of Psalm 23, Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Just bow your heads with me just for one moment. I'd almost see God at times saying, is there anyone here in that building in in York, in the Rock, in Priory Street, to whom I may show kindness for Jesus' sake? I'd say, God, there's a bunch of people here with everybody. And even more so than David, who was wanting to show kindness beyond his obligation, the God of heaven, the God of creation, the the Abba of Jesus, the Father of Jesus, wants to show kindness beyond obligation. That means you don't earn it, you don't have to deserve it. You don't have to fix yourself. You don't have to be this or be that. What you simply have to be willing to do is say, I'll come and sit at his table. And that's what Mephibosheth did. So he moved. He moved to Jerusalem so he could sit at the king's table. There's still somehow in a strange way a demand on our life that when we want to sit at the king's table, it asks us to make a move, to to move from where we are in our thinking, in 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 our position, in our in our self-assessment, in our self-condemnation, in our self-righteousness, to move from there in our thinking and say, I'm willing to receive that kindness beyond obligation because I want to sit at the table where we all look the same. I don't know that Mephibosheth ever wasn't crippled in his feet. But it sure as heck didn't mean for the rest of his life what it had meant from being five up to that time. I know there are many things that can be fixed in our lives. I know there are, there are many things that remarkably, supernaturally, we get delivered from. Just like my dad in, in the pit. He, one man died, my father, my father lived, but... What I do know is this, that when we come to the king's table, life is not the same anymore. Whatever the wounds were, whatever the damage, whatever has been our disability in life, it's never the same again. Something is relieved, something is healed, something is fixed. And something was fixed that day in the heart of Mephibosheth. Suddenly he belonged. Suddenly he was accepted. Suddenly he felt good. Suddenly he and the king, who he should never have been attached to, were now one. And that's what God does in Jesus. And he invites you to come to that place. I'm going to pray in just one second and then we're through. But I just want to make opportunity. As I pray, maybe you tonight need to make a move and say, I want to make that move to be at the king's table where we all look the same, where where the grace of the giver is bigger than the problem of the recipient. And where the giver comes down and the recipient comes up and the two become united in fellowship. That, that really is the Christian gospel. So I'm going to pray in a moment. If you'd like to be particularly personally included in that prayer, that you're saying I'm making a shift to sit at the king's table tonight with all my woundedness, my, my brokenness, my disabilities, my scars, then just slip up your hand right now because I just want you to make a move so you can be in this prayer and something can happen.
for you in Jesus' name. I'm just going to wait for one moment. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, take your hands down any more that just want to be in this prayer. I, d- I didn't ask you to do that for me so I can think, oh, it was, you know, it's quite wonderful all these hands went up. I, I asked you to do that really for you because, uh, you know, our human condition is such that if we don't sometimes make a response to something, then, you know, something doesn't shift on the inside of us. So I, I want something to shift on the inside of you right now because the invite is come and sit at my table. That's always God's invite. It's come and sit at my table. He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. All that condemnation, all that judgment coming against us. But today when we come and sit, that all gets washed away because now we're with the king whose kindness has caused us to be accepted where we were rejected, healed where we were sick, changed where we couldn't change. It's all there. So I'm going to pray right now. I just want you to receive in your heart. Father, in Jesus' name, as we come right now and just by faith, symbolically, sit at your table, we thank you and receive it with an open heart that as we sit at that table, all the stuff that seems to mitigate against us is under the table and you've got a feast for us on the table, a feast that says you're welcome, a feast that says you're accepted, a feast that says you're forgiven, a feast that says you're whole, a feast that says your wounds and your scars, no matter how they came, will not dictate your present or your future but that will now be determined by your right relationship with the one who invites you to the table. And so I thank you for your healing and your grace tonight, Father, and change in our lives because in here tonight as we sit here, we all look the same to you. We all look the same to you. And we thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're done. We love you. Stay and have something to eat. If you need to chat, come and chat to us. Other than that, we'll see the other guys on Wednesday, the uh, early adopters, and then uh, be back again next Saturday. Bless you. We love you.